Ambassador at Large with the Singapore Foreign Ministry and concurrently Singapore's representative to the ASEAN Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. She's also the chairman of the Lee Kuan Yew Centre for Innovative Cities in the Singapore University of Technology and Design and also the chairman of the National Arts Council. Um, and of talk and talk. And I look at people's eyes and I talk to them. But I'm talking to architects and designers, and if I don't put up some pictures, I have no credibility. <laughs> so if I'm out of sync with the pictures, it's because I don't control the slides very well. But let me try. Ah, I can't. I'm a Parisian. I cannot live anywhere but in Paris. And look at that. A Londoner walks down Kensington High Street and she thinks to herself, I'm a Londoner, I cannot live anywhere but in London. A New Yorker walks down the street, he hears the street sounds and he says to himself, I cannot live anywhere but in New York. Now, these are two scenes of Singapore, and I ask myself, will Singaporeans walking down the street think, I am a Singaporean, I cannot live anywhere but in Singapore? I don't know the answer yet, there are Singaporeans in the audience, and it would be good if they could express something, you know, something to suffer on my way home. Then the next slide. That is a garden in Bishan Estate. So the trees are the same. For 20 plus years I've been going there. It's still the same trees, but the trees have matured. And that means something to me. And see this coffee shop there. You know, this marks the neighborhood. All the aunties and housewives will go there and have tea after they finish their housework at around 11 or 11.30 a.m. And that's the neighborhood place. For them, this has meaning. And down the street, I walk to my home, it has a meaning. So meaning, this Singaporean, this young Singaporean woman, finds the attachment to place as she thinks about her neighborhood. Now, what have I described? Parisian who's feeling that I live in Paris, I cannot live anywhere but in Paris. It is an attachment to place, a sense of belonging, and is a rootedness. It creates this attachment. Is it a composition? Is it composite? Or is it something specific? You know, little lanes, intimate spaces, building against building, a favorite building. What is it? The sound of the street. I imagine the attachment is created by all of the above. You probably cannot put your finger on any one matter. I'm not a designer. My question to designers is, can you design for attachment? And here, it brings me to the idea that Joe Hopkins, an uh, urbanologist, a well-known urbanologist, has often spoken of. Joe Gordon speaks of sacred spaces. He said in every city that works, in every thriving city, there must be a sacred space. Now what is a sacred space? Can you design a sacred space? I do not think so. A sacred space, that quality is endowed upon the space by people. Is a sacred space because you call it a sacred space. It's sacred to you. And if it's sacred to many people in the same city, then it's a sacred space. The cloisters in New York, many people consider it a sacred space. I ask Singaporeans, what is a sacred space for you? And they said, botanical gardens, the botanics. That's a sacred space. Another example is the National Library. 
That's a sacred space. Not, they didn't say this new National Library, but the old National Library that was knocked down because it brought memories to people. It had a special meaning. They met their boyfriends and girlfriends there. They traded a lot of papers and they studied together for the exams. So it was special. You just go to the National Library to meet up somebody for coffee. So that makes it a sacred space. Now, I don't know if you uh, read the papers during the Arab Spring. I was very struck by one report. Apparently, the Islamists had gone to Alexandria and they were beginning to uh, protest and demonstrate. The fights took place there. And some people wanted to burn the library at Alexandria. Burning the library in Alexandria. This old library that had so many manuscripts and was so precious. A number of students from the University of Alexandria lined up in front of the library and held hands to stop the crowd from coming to attack the library that morning. And I said to myself, looking at the picture, they have just made that a sacred space. And for them, that library of Alexandria, if it isn't already a sacred space, would now be a sacred space. But the question is, is what makes that attack? And talking to my young colleagues again, I would say they talk of history, you know, attachment must have history to it. You cannot have an attachment if there's no history and there must be memory experience and memory of that experience, a familiarity. I think these are the qualities that go to make up attachment. Now, I have a second definition of social capital. I'm a political scientist. Robert Putnam is a well-known Yale political scientist. He is famous for his book, Bowling Alone, but he has another book. It's on democracy, studying democracy in an Italian town. I forgot the exact title. And he made famous this word, social capital. When he uses the word social capital, he talks of civic virtue, connections amongst individuals, social networks that arise, and the norms of reciprocity in that network, trustworthiness that arise from them. I just say bonding, bridging, binding, bonding, binding, bridging that happens in a community. That creates social capital. And if you sit, if you can say in this place, people cooperate. They work together for solutions. That creates social capital. You are creating social capital. And can you design to foster and encourage citizens, people, to come together to work for the good of the neighborhood, to find solutions to whatever problems there are? And I picked up these words. I'm not the architect. Someone said to me, these days we are talking about incomplete design. If you design for incomplete design, you actually encourage people to work together. Do you leave white space in a neighborhood, in a place? I asked HDB, can you leave a space so that the residents in that neighborhood come together and say, this is what I want to do with that space. And if you do that, you generate that network, that habit of cooperation that creates the social capital. The other idea of design is inconvenient design. Don't make everything work so well. If everything works so well, it's not very good for human relations. For instance, if you put some steps, you know, when you go from one place to another, older people that come along they can't climb the steps or they need help. The passerby may say, Auntie, can I help you? Or Uncle, can I help you? And you force an interaction. Or the older person may find struggle, you know, sort of trying to climb the steps. And 
may say to somebody, may coming along, can you help me? I cannot go up. So some inconvenience in the design may start to generate a conversation. So I guess this is what you mean by, can you introduce inconvenient design or incomplete design in what you are doing to help generate social capital? But I think, I'm not a designer, and I would say probably it's technology that will generate more social interaction and cooperation rather than the design. I am told by a member of parliament of Holland and Bukit Timah, Mr. Liang Eng Hua, that he's seen this collaboration happening amongst new residents. It is not the design, but younger families moving into an HDB estate, young couples, they are contacting the member of parliament, they are contacting each other when they move into the estate. And they say, you know, the bus service is not good enough, what shall we do? You know, they contact each other through SMS and through the Facebook. And they start discussing of what they should do with the estate. Ironically, if your estate or condominium is not perfect, you actually generate better social interaction. Because, you know, you force people to talk to each other to find the solution to things. And that, but uh, in the estate, the Member of Parliament says they are actually finding people saying, well, you know, we need a playground, there isn't enough playground, shall we talk to the housing authorities of the estate and try to do something. So there is social capital being built up there. And uh, finally, I'm told even in the uh, private condominiums, you do see this, and it is, again, in the condominium, residents are sharing on Facebook to connect with each other, to decide what they want to do about the condominium and how to make things better. So I think it's not just design, <laughs> you have bad design, you generate it, but the technology will bring people together, and it is also generation because the residents who are of a younger generation, who are in their 30s, late 20s, and 40s, will probably be more inclined to use uh, Facebook and internet to connect with each other. And that, that does help uh, social capital. So uh, those are the ones I want to share. I have some remarks about whether designers can save the world, but I think I should save it. Yeah, don't come later. Thank you.